my friends and happy Wednesday. Um, April, what's today going to be? 22nd? <laughs> yes, April 22nd. Hope you are doing well with your distance learning. So I am going to read a couple more chapters in I Survived the Great Molasses Flood of 1919. Um, I know my friend Alex in Miss Loteros has expressed that he likes these I Survived stories, so that is cool. Um, I'm going to do a couple more in the Bad Kitty and start the Heidi Heckelbeck, the Wacky Tacky Spirit Week. So um, pull up a chair, pull up a piece of floor, a bean bag. Whatever you choose to sit and listen. And I want to do an extra shout out to my family who they are very supportive and they love to hear me read. And so I want to thank my mommy and my daddy for watching my YouTube channel and everybody else that supports me. You guys are awesome. So um, here we go. Chapter five. Oh, let me recap, though, um, because it's been a couple of weeks, maybe. For the Great Molasses Flood. Um, when we left Chapter 4, Carmen's father was ill. And so when uh, she and Tony ran up to Tony's mom, Tony's mom had to tell them that Carmen's dad was sick. So we're going to start with Chapter 5 here. All right. Carmen wiped away tears as she and Tony and Mrs. Grosso hurried through the streets. Mrs. Grosso had explained what happened, that Papa had become very ill around lunchtime. Mr. Vita took Papa home in a wagon. He's in bed now, Mrs. Grasso continued as they passed the bakery. The doctor already came. He said your father has some kind of, of a flu. What? The word flu made Carmen feel calmer. The flu wasn't really a killer, like typhoid or polio or rabies. Carmen had the flu just last year. She'd felt rotten and was in bed for days, but within a week she was back to herself. Papa will be fine. Papa will be fine, Carmen repeated to herself as her boots clicked against the stone streets. And looking around her, everything was the same as always. There were the little kids playing hide-and-seek between the push carts piled high with fruits and vegetables. There was Mrs. Ortelli through the window of the bakery, chatting with her customers. There was the gray cat sunning himself outside the tailor's shop and the hams and sausages hanging in the butcher's window. There was a rat poking through a pile of trash. And, of course, there was Tony right next to her. But then, when they stopped at the corner to wait to cross the street, Carmen caught sight of something else. The newsboy, the one she and Tony had passed earlier. Carmen had barely listened to the headlines. He'd been shouting. But now Carmen slowed down and stared at the boy, waved, waved the afternoon paper at the people rushing by. Suddenly, his words seemed meant for Carmen. Deadly flu hits Boston. Carmen practically flew up the narrow staircase that led to their apartment. She rushed past Mr. Vita into the small bedroom she and Papa shared. Another neighbor, Mrs. Pirelli, was kneeling next to Papa's bed. But that man in the bed, that couldn't be Papa. He looked like a shivering ghost, deathly pale, lips tinged blue. His teeth chattered even though the bed was piled with blankets. Papa, Carmen rasped, dropping down to her knees. Papa's eyes fluttered open. The ghostly mask fell away for a few seconds. Mia Ragaza, he, he rasped, my girl. Carmen sat down, blinking away tears, forcing a smile. She would cheer him up, just like she cheered up Tony. Papa, she said, her voice shaking, I, I got another 100 on my math test. But Papa's eyes were already closed again. Carmen grabbed his hand. It was so hot, as if his blood was boiling and if his bones were on fire. She pulled a rickety chair over to the bed and sat down. I'm here, Papa, she said. I'm here. Hours passed and the sun went down. Papa tossed and turned, muttering in his sleep. And then came the cough, a hacking, wheezing cough like nothing Carmen had ever heard. It sounded like little bombs were exploding in Papa's lungs. Mrs. Pirelli and Mrs. Grasso sponged Papa's face and arms to cool him. They spooned medicine into his mouth, but Papa's skin got hotter. The cough got worse and worse. Carmen sat in her chair, gripping Papa's hand. Her mind kept drifting back to the flood after the earthquake, when Carmen clung to Papa's back as they were caught in the churning sea. Nana had told her the story so many times. I was up early that day, she always began, because that naughty goat escaped again. I would just reached the top of the hill when everything started to shake. The earthquake lasted 40 seconds, but it felt like years, she said. When it was over, she raced down the hill to the house. 
The roof had collapsed, but Mama, Papa, and Carmen made it out and were safe. We thought the worst was over, but we were wrong. The earthquake had caused the sea to rise up. Now tidal waves twenty feet tall slammed into the village. Your Papa grabbed you and tried to run, Nana continued, but nobody could outrun the sea. Nana always got a twinkle in her eye at this point. The water was strong, but your Papa was stronger. He grabbed a shutter from a ruined house. He climbed up on it and told Carmen to hold on to his back. The water rose and rose. They got separated from Nana and Mama. They floated on that shutter for hours. And this was the part that had etched itself into Carmen's mind, especially the words Papa had called out to her over and over. Hold on, he'd say. Now Carmen leaned into Papa an inch away from his sweat-covered brow. Hold on, Papa, she whispered. Please hold on. She gripped his hand. She held it tighter than she'd held on to Papa's back in the flood, tighter than anything she'd ever held in her life. She held on even after Papa stopped breathing, even after the doctor put the sheet over Papa's face, even after Papa's hand grew cold and Carmen understood that some things get taken away no matter how hard you try to hold on to them. It wasn't until much later when the sun came up that Carmen finally let go. Chapter 6, Almost Four Months Later January 15th, 1919, 7.30 a.m. Carmen was awake, but she kept her eyes squeezed shut. The mornings were always the hardest. She finally eased her eyes open and took some deep breaths. She listened for Papa's voice in her mind like she did every morning. Buongiorno, mi ragazza. Good morning, my girl. Good morning, Carmen whispered back. Hi, Carmi, a little voice chirped. Carmen looked down and two sleepy brown eyes peeped up at her. It was little Teresa, Tony's three-year-old sister. Go back to sleep, Carmen said with a smile. It's still early. Teresa flashed a gap-toothed grin and closed her eyes. At the end of the bed, Tony's other little sister, Marie, was curled up under a tattered blanket. Carmen reached over and tucked her in tighter. A snore rose up from the floor. That was Tony's six-year-old brother, Frankie. He was a skinny little bean, but he snored like a giant. He and Tony were asleep on a mattress tucked into the corner. Across the room, the curtain that hid Mr. and Mrs. Grasso's bed, was already pulled open. Carmen could hear them talking in the kitchen. This was Carmen's house now, the Grasso's two-room apartment. She'd been living here since the night after Papa died, when Mr. Grasso carried her upstairs and tucked her into bed with the two little girls. There were seven of them living here, crammed together like tomatoes in a jar. The noise was constant, the girls' giggles, Frankie's bouncing ball, Mr. Grasso's booming laugh, and the fighting. Frankie bit me. Marie wet the bed. Teresa's eating a cockroach. No wonder Tony couldn't study. But Carmen knew how lucky she was to be with the Grassos, who treated Carmen like family. Carmen looked over at Tony, fast asleep with drool dripping out of the corner of his mouth. He had hardly left Carmen's side since Papa died. He'd even started reading The Wonderful Wizard of Oz aloud at bedtime. It puts the girls to sleep, he said. But Carmen had a feeling he was reading it for her. He somehow sensed... <clears throat> And hearing about Dorothy made Carmen feel better, like she wasn't the only girl who sometimes felt completely lost. Worse than lost, there were moments every day when Carmen's heart seemed to be crumbling apart, like the church tower in her village after the earthquake. But then Tony would tell her one of his dumb jokes. Frankie would come racing over to show her a new baseball card. The girls would climb up onto her lap, or Mrs. Grasso would ask her to stir the pot of tomato gravy. With all these kids, there was always work to be done, Carmen Carmen tried to help Mrs. Grasso out as much as she could, which was what she was doing now instead of lying there like a lump. Carmen quickly got dressed. She stared out the window as she brushed the knots from her hair. Of course, her gaze went straight to that ugly molasses tank rising up in the distance. It was impossible to look out the window and not see it. And now the tank would always remind Carmen of that terrible day that Papa got sick. She remembered those strange noises she and Tony had heard, how they'd run away in fear and then fallen down laughing. It amazed Carmen to think of how carefree she felt on that bright September day. She'd had no idea that Papa was sick, that the Spanish flu had already sunk its fangs into Boston, that they would all soon find themselves caught in the middle of one of the deadliest disease outbreaks in history. The epidemic spread through Boston and across the country and the world. Tens of millions had died so far. Mr. Lawrence told them it was even more deadly than the Black Death a plague that struck Europe during the time of the nights. Here in Boston, hospitals ran out of bed. Schools and theaters and movie houses were shut down to slow the spread, but nothing helped. Bodies piled up in the streets. 
There weren't enough grave diggers to bury the hundreds dying each week. Carmen wasn't the only kid at school who'd lost a parent. Some lost two, and brothers and sisters. So much had changed since she and Tony stood together in the shadows of the molasses tank. But that tank hadn't changed at all. It was still huge and ugly and leaking. Carmen sat on the edge of the lumpy mattress to button up her brand new boots. The Grassos had given them to her for Christmas. Her last boots were so small her toenails had turned black. Carmen stood up and <clears throat> wiggled her grateful toes. She figured she'd help Mrs. Grasso with breakfast and then head to school with Tony and Frankie. She tiptoed toward the kitchen door. She could hear Mr. and Mrs. Grasso talking over their morning cup of coffee. Carmen's a gem, Mrs. Grasso was saying. The kids adore her. They were, ta they were talking about her? Carmen crept closer. She sure is, Mr. Grasso agreed. Carmen flushed and smiled a little. When are we going to tell her? Mr. Grasso said. The ship doesn't leave for another week, Mrs. Grasso answered. No need to worry her about the voyage. Carmen froze. Ship? Worry? It's such a long journey, Mr. Grasso said. It's going to be tough. Italy is very different from here. The hairs on the back of Carmen's neck stood up. I know, Mrs. Grasso said, but it's for the best. Carmen and her grandmother will be together again. Carmen stepped back. It was suddenly very hard to breathe. The room started to spin as she understood what they were saying. They were sending her back to Italy. And I think that that chapter is very interesting since it's the Spanish flu and it's killing all these people and schools are shut down. And now we have the coronavirus shutting everything down. Very interesting parallels right there. Okay, so that is it for this week's uh, I Survived. And look for a few more stories uh, later on today.